Hi guys, my name is Marcus and I'm a property agent in Singapore and today I'm going to talk about four good practices before buying a property in Singapore because I think this is very important. I let all my clients know during my client consultation and today if you are watching this, good for you because you get free advice. So when I say free advice, please help me to tap the like button because it's absolutely free and this will brighten my day. And don't forget to subscribe because we do weekly contents like this. So without further ado, let's go. So first and foremost, uh, we need to do our financial checks because many people when they are looking for property, they get very excited, go property guru, they go everywhere to look for properties, they arrange with agents and go for viewing sometimes even because they are so excited. Absolutely nothing wrong. This is exactly what I used to do as well. But first step importantly is to check your loan eligibility. Why? Because it will largely affect what is the buying quantum you can purchase. For example, if you are self-employed, especially you are subject to a 30% haircut. So that includes commission-based earners as well. So please go and check with your bank. So haircut means, example, if you are making 100k a year, which is quite a lot, the bank will only assess your eligibility based on 70%. So you'll be very shocked oh, if let's say the person is 40 years old, about my age, and makes 100k, you got a car installment, 1,500. Want to buy $1.5 million property, can or? Buy right, can right? Can right, can right? Uh -huh. So if the person can only loan 300k, you can only own 300k, you buy HDB, don't buy Putao. Ah. You want to buy a condo, a HDB 800k in Yishun EM, also cannot afford 100k a year. Leh. So that is very insane. If you ask me, this is actually how the government prevents people from over leveraging, prevents people from biting off too much they can chew. Especially because if you are self employed, your income may not be very consistent. So this becomes a fail safe. Ah, fail safe, huh? My Amor, not bad one. No, like the writer, right? Man? So it becomes like uh, defensive measures for buyers when they buy in something, they need to take extra precaution. Why? Because today, the moment when people are experiencing selling pressure, right, then they will have to sell at a lower price. And for people that don't need to sell, right, we are affected as well. Why? Because the valuation will drop because your neighbors are selling at a lower price. So this is to defend the overall market from crashing and this has been in place for the last 10 years. That's why when people always tell me that, oh, I'm hoping for the market to crash, don't need to wait, lah. it's not gonna happen. Lah. Yeah, so if you're still waiting, right, and you, are, you need some knowledge, give me a call, I can give you my consultation, I can show you the market trends for you to have a greater clarity, and also most importantly, to provide you with a more safe purchase. So if you watch my other videos, I always advocate a 20% buffer when you're buying. So check out my other videos, I'll link them in the description. Go check them out. The chances of having to sell at a loss is absolutely minimized if you apply the fundamental of 20% buffer. Yup. So, this is shocking. 100k, 100k is high income already. So, you can buy HDB EM no not buy because you're self-employed. Now you know, actually quite sad. When we are self-employed, like I'm Fong Kong, they want to take loan, the bank also doesn't lend you. Also, because of the age, maybe I just highlight to you. Today is interesting because if you have not been buying properties for quite a while, right? Like for the last two, three years, right? The landscape has changed quite dramatically because right now banks are using 4.8 for TDSR. And we'll come back to that later. Please stay till the end because TDSR is very complex and yet it's very interesting. If you know how it works, then it's easy easier for you to move forward. So rule number one, check your finances first because you'll be end up wasting time looking at properties that you cannot really buy. Good practice number two, having enough cash for your stamp duties. Did you know that when you're buying a resale property, you need to use your cash to pay for your stamp duty first? Because many people that I know, they thought that they can actually use CPF to pay for their stamp duties because if you buy an HDB, you're able to do that. But for private property, nope, you need to put in cash first and then apply for a cash refund after completion. To deduct your use of CPF, pay for your stamp duty, and then IRAS will actually return your cash. And that takes a few weeks as well. So before you prepare your finances, right, make sure you have the cash portion for that. CPF, not applicable. By the way, guys, if you are just starting out looking for a property, you may not know why it's buyer stamp duty, but I won't go into the details. I'll link them in the description. For example, for buyer stamp duty, for a purchase of a $1 million property, you use it to multiply by 4% minus 15,000 for, and that will be the payable buyer stamp duty. But don't get ahead of yourself. It's not as simple as this because the rate that is being used to calculate increases with the purchase quantum. So before buying, go to the description, click on the link, find out more, do your own due diligence and do your sums correctly. And before I move on to point number three, many of the costly mistakes were made because the, due to the lack of knowledge and that is a result of not liking this video and not subscribing to my channel because we are posting weekly videos like this that adds massive value to make sure that when you are buying a property, you do not make any mistake and you get it right, right from the start. So please subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and if you have already done so, leave a comment so that I know who you are. See you soon!
So good practice number three, checking the property valuation before making an offer. So some of you may already know that when you get see something you like, you can send the details of the property to the bank and the bank can actually give you the valuation. And the difficult part is that different banks will give you different kind of valuations. So for the buyer and seller, it's always a tug of war because as usual, sellers want the highest valuation, determine their property value based on the highest and the buyers will usually want the lowest. So how do you find the common ground? This usually takes an agent to help because why? Number one, you need to check in on yourself whether your level of urgency, how urgent and how much do you really want that unit. And number two, also the level of scarcity because if you check the last transacted unit of this similar type was like one year ago and you really want the house for your kid's school or whatnot or you really need the space and you are specific in that location, then I would say that as a buyer, you may have to consider going uh, compromising to the higher end of the valuation. Why? Because you don't want to miss this unit and wait another one year and you, your plans are all screwed. Up. Number two, you can also get your agent to check in with the previous transacted unit who sold the unit and call the agent to find out what was the condition of the unit because the bank may give you 3.5 because they think they assume that this unit is nicely renovated. But actually, you go in, right? The renovation doesn't suit you and it's not nice at all. Then what if the last transacted unit at 3.6 million was a nicely renovated unit which owner spent like 500k to renovate it three years ago? Then if you go on the higher end of the valuation, you might be overpaying for the unit. So that's all for pointer number three. Number four, last but not least, do not apply for any credit cards or bank loans during the period where you want to purchase the property. So many of you may not know, I will say most of you will not know, that when you apply for a bank loan to purchase a property, you literally need to show all your credit card statements. Every statement, if you got like Citibank, you got a easy credit, you got three credit cards, total four accounts, right? You need to show them the last four statements to state that you do not have any more outstanding. And let's say you have bank credit cards you got it right you literally need to take out all the statements and send to the bank to verify that you don't have any outstanding if not for each credit card right they will take out a certain amount from the TDSR that means they will assume that you have a certain amount of credit they will still owe they will minus it off your 55% TDSR and that is a lot and that affects your property purchase massively like for example I just bought another house part of the credit cards right I never use for the longest time I don't have the PIN number I have to go to the bank and if you haven't been to the bank for the longest time you need to wait very long. So to get one credit card statement, I need to go down there, verify, and some banks cannot even give you the statement. You need to go back, wait for them two weeks later, then they email you, they send you the physical copy. If you want to know which bank, keep me up, I will let you know, cancel the credit card, bro. It's very, very fun. So don't apply for credit cards, don't take out any bank loans because it will hurt your credit score badly, badly, real bad. So that last thing you want to do, okay, we the channel. Now, going back to the TDSR, right? Earlier on, we mentioned this guy that makes 100,000 per annum and can only loan 300 over K. So today, if this guy is not self-employed, how much do you think the person can loan? So this guy is making 8,000 a month, but he can only loan 559,000. So that's why I said just now, don't apply for credit card, don't take up car loan at this point in time because it will hurt your property purchase. Now, let's minus off the car loan. Assuming if you don't have a car loan, the person can loan up to 858,000, which gives you some options because you can find some older we sell two bedroom condos that can be find something at about 1.1 million ish so don't buy a car and it gives you a lot more options so that's all i have for you today if you need any more help do contact me and i'll see you soon